Welcome. So Megan Anderson from Wanderlust, Chief Marketing Officer. Now, Wanderlust is a four-day work week company and a remote first. So I want, I want, I think everybody always hears four-day work week. That's great. Remote, great. Two combinations together. It's fantastic. It's like, what is that? Reese's peanuts, you know, butter, nut, whatever that is, like chocolate and peanut butter together. This is like, this is what Wanderlust is. So yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit more about it without a bad analogy and <laughs> what really happens, you know, with Wanderlust with four day work week. And um, yeah. I think people love to hear about it. Yeah, I'm happy to. And by the way, any analogy that has peanut butter and chocolate <laughs> is a good analogy. So it's good, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so Wanderlust group has been um, operating on a four day work week for um, coming up on a year and a half. So we started in 2020 uh, at the kind of, spike of the the pandemic here in the states and um you know it started because the ceo was noticing just a lot of strain that the team was under and thought hey you know what we can take a hit to productivity for a couple of months by giving people time back in their lives for the sake of the health of the team right and so they did a temporary pilot where they switched to a four-day work week in the summer of 2020 and what they found was the exact opposite they did not take a hit to productivity in fact not only did employee morale go up as people started to get control of their lives again, um, but it, what followed was one of the most you know, productive periods in the company's history. Uh, we saw 100% year-over-year growth in the 12 months after we um, went to a four-day work week. We were able to maintain support call time, wait times. We were able to maintain kind of sales productivity. And what we found really was that work fits the contours that you give it. And so um, after, uh, I want to say about six months, the company made it a standard permanent practice. And so we've been on a four-day work week ever since. And so ever since through 2020, so you talk about two-ish plus years, right? That's right. I said a year and a half and I didn't realize <laughs> yeah. that uh, it's been a time warp. Oh, right? I didn't mean to correct you that way. I didn't mean it that way. I just, I'm yeah, just, yeah. Um, but just because no, you know, I'm almost like thinking out loud because that's enough time to really judge. Is it working? You know, if it was only like three months, six months, a cynic could say, oh, of course, they're doing, you know, doing everything they can to get the four day work week, you know, under their belt. And then who knows what will happen. But two years is enough to judge that it's working, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I will say like, it's, it's a change, right? You can't mm -hmm. just flip the switch and move to a four day work week and keep everything else the same about the way that you operate as a company. Uh, it really required us to set some new standards and how we operated to change the way that we communicated to just find more efficiencies throughout the week. And, you know, we've had some things that worked really well. We've had some stumbles along the way. Uh, but yeah, after, after two years, I can say it really is working. Um, and, you know, we've been able to hit the same goals, uh, exceed the goals often um, that we laid out for ourselves without having to be on a full five-day-a-week schedule. Now, what this might be a silly question, but what happens on the day off? And I think it's Mondays that you have off, not where others will do Friday, but you're doing the Monday. Uh, the Monday. What happens if you have to get in touch with somebody there and no one's around? Yeah. Is that an issue or...? So, uh, you know, we set the expectation that like it, in an emergency, in a crisis, just like if there were a crisis on a weekend, you mm -hmm. might be called in. If the entire, you know, system goes down on a weekend, you're probably going to get a call, right? And so we hope those those occasions are really rare for multiple reasons. Uh, nobody wants to have a crisis on a regular basis. Uh, and they have been. Uh, but there is the expectation with the team that like, look, you know, uh, Mondays are yours, but if something you know major happens, uh, we will reach out. We will get in touch with you, and usually we do that through text or call because we are asking people to be off their email, off their Slack notifications. Um, so that's our main kind of like emergency clause. Um, I think beyond that, there have been a couple of occasions where, for example, uh, we work with marinas, and um, if a marina is having an opening booking day, which is like the, the, the day that they first open up in a season for reservations, and that happens to fall on a Monday, we may ask a, a cross section of people to be in, but then we'll give them another day that week to take off so that they maintain that four day. The other thing that I'll call out um, as far as nuance is 
we we wanted to make this a reality for our team, but we didn't want to do it at the expense of our customers. And so we built a rotating schedule for our customer support team, wherein um, they still work four days a week, but their four days rotate unlike the rest of the company. So somebody may work Monday through Thursday and get Friday off. The, the Somebody else on the support team may work Tuesday through through Friday, and that will sort of be on a rotating schedule. So that makes sense. So this way you have it twofold. One, that it's understood that if something happens, it, even though, and I like what you were saying, that you get off the Slack and the text and the emails because most people feel the pressure. All right, I know we're off you know, on a Monday, but I should, uh, maybe I should just show that I'm doing something. But it's great that it takes that pressure off so everyone knows I don't have to worry. But then you rotate it around so that if there is an emergency, you know, it's fair that there's some people always going to be around. So you don't have to kind of stress out in case, because, you know, how something crazy happens, like no one's around and then you lose your biggest customer and what have you. So I think that's smart. Yeah. Another thing, Megan, maybe we could take a step back because we just launched into, because, you know, it was me trying to get the attention of people by talking about four day work week and, you know, and, 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 you know, remote first, but maybe you could talk a little bit about what Wonderlust is all about, like your business and, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So the Wonder, Wonderlust group is a collection of brands that are uh, focused on the outdoors, right? And so we call them outdoor tech, which is kind of a, an oxymoron, <laughs> but we are, Wanderlust group is comprised of these marketplaces that connect outdoor adventurers to destinations. So Dakwa connects boaters to marinas. If you want to um, tie up, if you're sailing up the coast and you want to tie up at a slip and you want to make that reservation, you can make it through Dakwa. Uh, Marinas.com is sort of like the Yelp of the, of the waterways. Uh, you can find lighthouses and yacht clubs and fuel docks and all sorts of things on there with reviews. And then our forthcoming product, Campouts, kind of moves off the water and goes into the land uh, and sort of does that same kind of matching um, for campers and campgrounds. It's so interesting. So how did they come up with that idea? Because I guess it's it's in Newport, Rhode Island, so you're by the water, so that yeah. makes sense. And I imagine the people who work there, are they very much into boating? Or do you have to be into boating? Or is it just helpful to know that? We have a mix, right? So we have some people who on their Mondays off, on their weekends, they like the first thing they do is step on a boat. Uh, yeah. And then we have others who have never set foot on a boat. So we definitely have a mixture of people. What I will say is that most people who join the Wanderlust group kind of do have this shared value of we think outdoor time is important, right? This is We've just spent the last two plus years going from live streaming uh, to doom scrolling to Zoom conversations and this sort of endless loop of sitting in our offices staring at screens. And there's nothing wrong with screens, but it is important to break away from that every once in a while and to get outside and in nature and um, kind of get some perspective about the world around you. And so I, I do find that people who work at the Wanderlust Group share that value and are sort of drawn to that idea of how cool is it to build technology that is designed to get people fundamentally off technology and into the world? Yeah, that is kind of a little meta, right? How you yeah, doing well, that, it, right? It's a little like weird. To be, uh, yeah, it's, it's an oxymoron for sure. <clears throat> now, with the nautical theme, is, 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 are the terms overused within the company? Like, hey, welcome aboard. <laughs> Uh, we're going to some headwinds. Uh, we're some rocky way waters. Is that does does, does that mean, happen? <laughs> it proliferates. So yeah, I mean, I think first of all, there's just a lot of that terminology embedded in speak to begin with. The, yeah. You know, the welcome aboards, the headwinds. Uh, you know, set, set our compass for for this direction or another. Uh, but we are just kind of like dad joke city internally with the puns <laughs> we use. Um, and after a while. You don't even notice it happening. Like I'm not a very <laughs> nautical person. I, I did grow up in like a harborside town, but I don't sail or boat or anything anymore. My outdoor activity is more like going for long hikes with my dog. Mm -hmm. But God, do I use nautical terminology <laughs> right and center. And our our roadmap uh, is called for, for building the product. So our engineering roadmap, <laughs> we call that the binnacle, uh, which is sort of a navigational tool. Yeah. Uh, there's all sorts of things like that across the, the company. Is there a little bit of a competition to see after after a while to come up with the, 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 the worst pun, the worst? Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, 
not a competition so much, but whenever it happens, it's every everybody sort of like <laughs> pauses and gives some respect on like, okay, that that was a new that was one. good. That was a good one, right? Yeah. That was a, so so in addition to so what are some of the things with a four day work week? Have you have you noticed that the applications, you know, have risen tremendously? And do you have to be careful? Are they just doing it for a four day work week, or they really want to work for this company? How how does that play out? Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting. It's it's hard to extract four day work week from this like larger theme of the great res- resignation that's going on from just the fact that we're growing as a company. But for example, you know, prior to moving to a four day work week, um, we had you know a little over thirty companies, um, and we had like a hundred, just over a hundred people apply to open jobs at our company in 2020 before we moved to a four day work week. Uh, The following year we had in 2021, we had just over 2000 people. Wow. So going from a hundred people to 2000 people applying, like that's quite the increase. And certainly I think that both being a remote company and being a company that operates on a four day work week had to have had an impact on that, right? So those are the surges we're seeing in interest in working at Wanderlust. Um, and, you know, if I'm just going to boast for a little bit about a company I love, it, it really is just like a great place to work. The I love the values that this company has. I love what we're trying to build. Um, I love how, as a marketer, I love writing about, you know, the outdoors and, you know, oceans and, and wilderness, uh, as opposed to some of the other topics that I've written about in my, mm-hmm. in my career. Um, but so that that influx has been great to see uh, from a hiring standpoint. I think, yeah, we do have to sort out, you know, in the application process and the interview process where people's motivations are. And, you know, is it is do their values and their skills uh, and their motivation sort of line up for what we need in the role? Uh, and that kind of, you know, that takes some questions and in, in the interview process and we watch out for it. Um, we don't lead that much with it. We don't. We find we don't have to talk that much about mm-hmm. it in the interview process because people have heard right loosely, and it tends to be at the offer stage that we talk about it, and really importantly at the onboarding stage, because the interesting thing is you could want a four-day work week and be really excited to come on board for it, but it does require a change in the way that you operate. And so when you're getting onboarded, it's important to talk about how are you going to operate differently as a result of having a shortened work week um, than you did in prior jobs. And that can be a bit of like a culture adaptation for people. Uh, that, and that's been one of the lessons I think that, that we've learned out of all of this, that you have, to, you have to be intentional about onboarding into this kind of a work schedule. So when you mean intentional, that you can, let's say I come into the office on Tuesday, I have to be very structured it can't be, you know, you know, I've been working remote now for a while, but before the pandemic, you know, you'd go into an office and you'd see, you know, somebody comes in at the crack of 9.15, then they're like, hey, want some co- coffee? You know, all right, I'm going to do the Starbucks run. And you come back now, it's like 9.45, 10 o'clock. And then, you, 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 you know, you kibitz a little bit with your coworkers. And then by 11, you know, you're talking about lunch. So it sounds like that can't happen, right? For the most part, you have to be really like, nope, I got to have blinders on. And just focus and deliver. Is that is that what you mean by right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's we work the four days that we are on. We work, and uh, I think the biggest threat to a four day work week or to shorten work week of any sort is the proliferation of meetings. Mm -hmm. So uh, meetings are incredibly costly things. You think about the the salaries of everybody that's pulled together into a meeting, and the fact that you're taking them off work and off what they do best so that you can have a conversation that's valuable if it's the right conversation and if that that meeting has been structured correctly but if it's just like a bunch of standing meetings or you don't really know what to do so you kind of get together and try to hopefully brainstorm and figure it out the more meetings that get added to a shortened work week the less time there is or any work week the less time there is for work and that gets incredibly important to be disciplined about in a four day work week. So sometimes somebody will join up and they've come from maybe a big company. They're used to having meetings for everything. There's sort of a retraining that has to happen around 
what's the right stage at which a meeting is the right tool for you to move forward that work, right? And so that, that just takes some adjustment. So we, um, every week, uh, we kick off uh, the week with our CEO writes a letter to the company that he posts on our internal wiki and that kind of sets the tone for the week. Uh, we will kind of take an audit of the meetings that are on the schedule. And if there's not an agenda for that meeting or a clear deliverable that needs to come out of it without any concern, like we will ax that meeting because we need to free up. So I'm, I'm doing like a continual mm -hmm. hygiene of my calendar heading into the week. Uh, and then we figure out what is it that we want to be able to say we did that week and prove that we did. There's a lot of like reporting, um, kind of asynchronous reporting that goes on to make sure that we're making progress. Just to also put in, we can put in some context too about how many people work at the organization. So we are, um, I've been saying over 60 for a while, but I actually think we're getting closer to 80 now. Um, so I think that's, uh, as, as of the most recent hires, I think we're, we're nipping at 80 if we're not over it. So with 80, then that starts to happen with these meetings and, hey, let's have a meeting for this. Let's have a meeting to talk about the meeting. Let's have yes. a meeting after the Easy. meeting is over to, yeah. to breathe. And it could get really clunky. So this way, and then I imagine what could be a good thing is that you have the, you know, the four-day work week. But then if you do have all these meetings and you have all these other things and you're not focused, then people probably feel more stressed, like, oh my God, I got to get everything done. Now it's Thursday. Now it's Friday afternoon, instead of like being excited, it's Friday afternoon and we're in the spring and especially where you are in Newport, you're like, oh my God, it's gonna be beautiful weather out. Now you're stressed yeah. because I got to get it all done. So now how did it, does it, each person have to self-police themselves to make sure, hey, I'm on task. I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Is it up to the manager? Or after a while, you just get used to, okay, no one's cracking the whip, but you know, every all like collectively everyone knows, okay, if we all do a great job, we have that, you know, just four days and we could chill and, you yeah. know, and it's all good. So it, it's important that everybody on the team has really clear goals um, and targets that they're going towards, right? Uh, because if you have a goal, if you got something that you are accountable for that you own, then it's really clear if you're using your time wisely or not. Right. Uh, it, mm -hmm. And you can have that ownership of, hey, you know, I've I'm looking at my calendar and I don't have the right that I don't have enough work blocks in here to hit that target that I'm going for at the end of the week. So I'm going to clear some stuff off and we give people the freedom to make that call um, and to opt out of a meeting if they if they need the work time mm -hmm. provided that they communicate that and they follow up on any deliverables that they have for it. Uh, so there is a sense of personal accountability for it. There's also a role that managers play in reinforcing that and helping to coach to that, right? So again, you know, there have been times over the course of um, working here where I've noticed that someone like logged in on a day off or, or logged in on a weekend or sent an email, not logged in because I wouldn't notice that, but like mm -hmm. sent an email on a weekend um, and you know, had, had a conversation to be like, hey, you know, what's up? Like, are you, how's your workload? What's going on there? Um, and together kind of work with them to reshuffle priorities, rescope projects, figure out where there is efficiency that we can gain in the week to, to get that time back. So there's kind of an ongoing coaching that, that managers can do, I think, too, to make sure that we are really living up to this challenge that we've set forth for ourselves. It, and with the remote option with the remote part do you do you get people from across the u.s or across the whole world and is it help with diversity and you know inclusion in the workplace because now instead of just getting newport which i imagine is just hard right because it's not like new york city or san francisco or silicon valley you know yeah. it's a great place i've been there i love it it's fantastic but you don't have as just just it's the law of large numbers you don't have that many people there so how does that play out yeah. So, I mean, one of the, at any company is one of the biggest benefits of going remote is that you can hire talent from all over the country and depending on your setup from all over the world. And that just really democratizes not only who can work for you, but, but uh, you know, what talent you can reach as a company. Uh, so we may find that the best, you know, the, the best customer success lead that we could hire lives in Michigan, right? 
Um, and having being remote enables us to hire for talent and hire for skill and not worry so much about location. Uh, so that's certainly a benefit. Uh, I think it also comes with, with considerations, right? I think that even more so than the four day work week, going remote changed the way that we communicated and operated because you're dealing suddenly with different time zones, right? So I need to be able to communicate more asynchronously uh, to my team and, and, and build a culture remotely um, that people that can make people feel included. Uh, so there's all sorts of considerations for that too, but I, I do think that for us, um, we have remote is a, is a very important part of not only, you know, building a diverse team, but building a team that's reflective of all the customers that we have. Uh, we have, we work with marinas that are, you know, in the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. and in the lakes region and their needs are very different, right? And so if we can hire people who understand everything down to the waterways and, you know, the seasonality and the currents there, that only makes us better. And, and what if people want to come into the office? Can they do that? Do they have that option? Yeah. So what we're starting to do, um, which I really like, is um, we're starting to open up kind of like micro offices in different parts of the country where we either have a concentration of employees or a concentration of customers. So, for example, um, you know, we, we have a cluster of people in Boston, employees in Boston. Mm -hmm. So we just opened up a very small office there that and give people the option to come in one, two, whatever days a week that they want to there that makes sense. Uh, we also have clusters of uh, employees and customers in Florida and in Colorado and in Maine. And so, you know, we're sort of in the process right now of figuring out what are the places that have the right cross section of, you know, a cluster of employees and target or existing customers that matter to us where it might make sense to have a, you know, a three desk, one conference room, mm -hmm. um, smaller rental for us to create um, a spot for them to meet up. And do you try to do things because if people come, you know, they get onboarded, it's remote, you don't see anybody in person. Yeah. Are there certain things that you try to do to just get some camaraderie, build up a corporate culture, have people just maybe even in person see each other, or at least maybe have Zoom calls to get to know one another? Yeah, so you have to work at culture, right? It's not, even if you're in one building, you have to do mm -hmm. things to make culture work, happen. Uh, and there, there are some things that happen naturally based on just a collection of people coming together, but there are also things that you can do to try to, um, to drive connections and make people feel more at home. So a few, we do a range of different things. Um, you know, uh, our chief of staff sets up um, these incredible like, Zoom lunches where you can get kind of dropped into a lunch with somebody else from a different part of the company and get to know them. Uh, we have uh, like geographical meetups. So last, um, I want to say it was last September, all of the Massachusetts area um, employees got together on a sailboat and went for, for a sunset cruise on a sailboat um, and other regions have done sort of similar meetups. And then as a company, you know, the, the pandemic and concerns over safety got in the way of this over the last couple of years, but, it, but we um, have a pattern in the past and, and intend to pick back up a pattern of getting together as a company once a year, picking up, like the nice thing about working with the customers that we work with is, God, they are great settings, right? So we can go to the Florida Keys and meet up as a company and, uh, you know, have a, a mixture of kind of a uh, off-site planning uh, session with social activities that that come together. So we try to pepper the year with those sorts of get-togethers. Um, and then I will say, I think tools like Slack deserve a tremendous amount of credit for enabling culture to sort of thrive remotely. Uh, we have Slack as our, our messaging service and we have Slack rooms that are certainly about work and projects, but we also have Slack rooms. There's one called the Great Outdoors where people can just share pictures from their Mondays off or their long weekends where they went hiking. Uh, we've got a Slack room called Dakwa, which is a place where we can share cute pictures of our dogs. Uh, 
we've got a, a tool that allows employees to sort of uh, say thanks and kind of congratulate and recognize their peers when they do something above and beyond. And that all takes place on Slack as well. So technology certainly helps Zoom, Slack, wikis, tr you know, project planning tools are all essential for remote work. And then you also want to pepper in, um, you know, interaction time wherever possible uh, throughout the year to sort of bring us together. Now, this might be a stupid question, but what happens in the cold weather? I mean, do people take out their boats or they just <laughs> store it? Like, does everything come to a stop or there's still Florida? I, how, yeah, yeah. Like, how does that work? Yeah, so I am a New Englander through and through. So yeah. I just assume that the world stops as soon as, you know, Thanksgiving hits. <laughs> um, but it turns out, and, if, and the numbers bear this out, there are whole parts of the country um, and world that, you know, don't, don't balk at winter. And so certainly our, you know, Pacific Northwest and our New England Northern marinas will get quieter during mm -hmm. the winter. That's also, by the way, a time where, they're less busy, so they're more willing to think about software and the tools that they need for the coming year. So we have a lot of conversations with them. And then the Southern parts of the country are just thrive all year long. And in fact, Florida, December, January, some of the busiest times in Florida um, and Southern California. So we have definite seasonality, but there's never a time during the year where it's slow. Uh, because some are coming online and really spiking while others are getting sleepier. I imagine this could scale up internationally if you haven't done so already. Are, are you international as well or not? Yeah, not? so we um, so uh, we just took Series C funding um, and one of the uh, plans with some of that funding is to help us spread internationally. Uh, we'll likely kind of branch out to spread, you know, we have a lot of like uh, uh, marinas that are on the border of Canada and the U.S. And so Canada is sort of a nice natural extension for us. Um, we do work with a bunch of marinas that are in the Caribbean already, um, but they, you know, we've worked with them in the past because they take the U.S. dollar. Um, I kind of see further expansion there and, and into Central and South America as well. Uh, so, you know, I don't have like definite plans for, for countries right now to share, but International expansion is definitely something that's on makes the sense, right? It makes yeah. it just why, like you know, the, because that is such a big, you know big market, and there's so many places, warm weather, <laughs> nice places, and then yeah. as a chief marketing officer, you probably have to go there and check it out yourself. So you might have to go to Spain and Greece, and I know it's going to be a hardship, but lives, right? Like right? I, I think it'd be irresponsible <laughs> if I just went <laughs> for this kind of. I think you have to. You know, not that you want to go to Greece, you know, in yeah. in the winter. <laughs> you know, when it's February here, but yeah. you got to check it out because right now, but seriously, like that, I imagine this scales up everywhere, you know, where that, especially, you know, where, I mean, there's so many beautiful places to go to and offer those services, right? No, it's true. And I think, you know, I think there's expansion into different countries. I also think there's vertical expansion. So I mentioned, you know, that the camping world is sort of on our horizon, some, some campgrounds have, have the same struggles that marinas have in terms of, you know, they've gone from, they really are living in the world of like pen and paper and phone and CB radio yeah. um, and need can really see new opportunities by digitizing some of those conversations and those records. Uh, and so there's expansion into different verticals like that that are ahead of us as well. Uh, and then the other thing that we're really excited about is, you know, we've got this two-sided marketplace of connecting outdoor adventurers to destinations. And right now there's like two or three things that they can do with us. They can find long-term storage for their boats. They can find fuel docks. They can find short-term slips. But we can imagine that really growing so that all sorts of, um, of parts of owning a boat from repairs to insurance to, um, you know, reselling uh, can, can take part in this marketplace. So I think that's another area where we really see we're just getting started uh, and want to really build out more, become more of a hub for all transactions for our boaters and outdoor adventurers. You know, this is kind of tangential, but what happens in a place where you're based and work needs to be done on boats where the, from what I understand, you know, the cost of living in some of these areas is so high that you just don't have the people there. Is that, does that happen? Where, where you are, where you kind of people kind of pushed out 
because of the tourists, because of people buying second homes there. And then you need some work done. And it's like, all right, where are all the workers? They're not around. Yeah, it's a really interesting phenomenon to sort of see happen right now. And it's, there's an uh, even like a new kind of plot twist that's have, happening right now in this where when the pandemic hit and remote work started taking over, the city sort of lost their monopoly on talent. And that meant that, you know, before but you had, maybe you had to live in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley or in New York City or Boston in order to, um, to get some of these high paying jobs. And now you can live anywhere. So we're also seeing a lot of migration to some of these beautiful, you know, tourist destination um, towns that aren't used to that influx, right. you know, to summer traffic, but they're not used to that influx of people wanting to move there permanently year round. And that does drive up the pricing for, um, for housing and cost of living in those areas. And so, you know, I, I think it has been a tough phenomenon for, you know, for cities all over the world of, of trying to maintain, you know, see this influx of new people and maintain your existing um, residents and make sure that they can still afford to live there. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things we often say is that marinas and harbors were really like the, the start of commerce for a lot of these small towns. And when a boater comes in from, you know, on a day trip uh, and, and lands at your marina and the harbor, they're on average going to spend about $300 in that town. You know, some at the marina, some at the local restaurants, some at, uh, mm. you know, local shops. And so the more trips we can drive into these um, small communities, the better that is for the surrounding economy, right? Um, and so we we try to lean into the positive ways that we can bring money into a town, but while also being very cognizant though, mm -hmm. that like all these towns are going through this very real strain and, and transition with their, you know, you need employees to run those marinas. Uh, and so, you know, we've been, we've been really fascinated by that dynamic shift too. It, it's, it, it is well, how on one hand, something positive could then trickle and then make it not so great. And it's, it's hard to kind of figure out how to make all these pieces work together. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's, and I don't know if you feel, it just seems everything is going so fast in terms of technology, in terms of business. It's, I've never seen it like that before where, and this is gonna sound kind of corny, but you know, you, you, you watch, you know, cable news and you just see everyone just, you know, fighting and arguing with each other on social media, the same thing. But then I speak all day to people like yourself who are doing like really cool, innovative things. And it's very, it's a lot of, it's positive. It's great. But for some reason that doesn't really make, you know, the press, you know, they don't report about it enough that, that, you know, all these, but I, it's shocking in a good way. How many new companies, I don't know if you notice it too, like you go on LinkedIn and you'll see like all these different companies, like, wait, What's that? And then you get, you presume it's, oh, it's a small little company because I've never heard of it. And then you look, you go 600 people, you know, unicorn status. Like, what? <laughs> like, wait, wait, where did this happen? This is wild, you know? Yeah. And you're going through this yourself, right? Because you, you, yeah. you've raised a whole lot of money. So all of a sudden, some same people say, wait, who's Wanderlust? Wait, what? what's up? I want to learn more about them. It does take, I mean, you really got to, you know, there's that old, um, it's like a blessing and a curse. Yeah. May you come of age in interesting times. And these are the most interesting <laughs> times, yes. right? For, for, for good and for bad. And I think that there has to be, it's like required of people to be reflective of everything that's going on right now and to sort of see the bright spots, but also the consequences of some of those changes and to look at them evenly and, and, um, just try to understand how to navigate through it and how do we make sure that we stack up the, the positives um, as at the same rate <laughs> as some of the challenges. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not to get off top, but it's, I don't know if our brains are wired this way where, you know, let's say if I put myself in the shoes of the folks there, hey, we just like, how much, if I may ask, like, how much have you just raised in this last uh, financing round? It was 30 million in the last right. round. So you just raised it in, in the last round, you raised money before that. So you're like, hey, we just raised 30 million. This is great. And then you, you turn on the TV and you see what's going on in the Ukraine. And then it's like hard to process. Like on one hand, well, we just got 30 million. It's great. And we're putting people to work and people working four day work weeks. 
you know, they're working remote, things are great. And then you look at that and go, oh my God, this is miserable. Yeah. And, Right. It's, it's a very bizarre time, right? It's And because of technology, we're able to see and yes. interact with all of it all the time. And and by the way, like that, that also means that like, there's, there's a lot more going on in the lives of your employees than, yes. you know, the podcast is called work happy. You could have the, or happy at work. You could have the best, you could have a great paying job and, you know, a great work schedule situation and you could still have just an immense amount going on in your personal life in a way that puts strain on you. Yeah. And so I think as managers, as, as peers, uh, we need to try to understand the larger context of what's going on in people's lives and in the world and have some perspective about both um, and factor that into like yeah. what it is, the decisions we're making. And um, something not as deep, <laughs> for people who, for so the people who are watching this, they're both people who would be interested, probably sending a resume over and, and applying, but then also, you know, leadership of companies that are thinking, hmm, I'm interested in doing this. Do you have any advice for people who are watching this now? And then after what we do is this, you know, we edit the video, clean it up a little bit, you know, so when I say stupid things, I can edit it out so I don't sound so dumb. And then <laughs> we post on social media and other, other sites. So when people watch, you know, you know, watch it again. Um, what's some advice for like the leadership for, for executives who are contemplating this and maybe they're on the fence and not sure what to do? What would you tell them about your, your firsthand experience going through this? So I would say, you know, treat this as an experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Give it a pilot period where you are going to set really clear goals and try it for a period of time and make sure that in doing so that you're not, again, you're not just lobbing a day off the schedule, you are changing the way that you operate as a company. And you're making some, you know, we, we cut about a third of our meetings when we went into this, right? And so you're making some changes fundamentally to the way that you work to go alongside of this and give it a pilot period of, you know, four months, six months to really be able to see what is it like in practice in your company. Um, and then you can make a decision that's more informed for you because any, you could look at us, you could look at Bolt, you could look at any number of companies, um, that have taken this on and still not have a good enough sense of what it would look like for your own company. So I would say dive in in an informed way for a pilot period to, to try it out. And there's, there's actually, um, there's an organization that's helping companies do this um that's moving uh, it, it's a four day four day work week um organization that's helping companies sort of architect these pilots so that they can make this shift uh and there's also it's been wild there's all all of these like job sites that have popped up and resource sites for the four day work week that just didn't exist when we did it even in 2020 uh so you're not alone if you try it now, and there's a lot more resources um, to sort of help you build out the program for yourself. That makes a lot of sense. It's so smart because, you know, this is one, one, one thing that the government does that drives me crazy. It's always like all or nothing. We have to do this and just pile in. Whereas in the business world, they're more exactly what you're saying. Wait, wait, wait. Before we jump into this, I was going to say we could jump before we jump into the deep end, yeah. but I, I, I stopped myself from saying that, but I just did say <laughs> that. So, <laughs> so. Before you jump into the deep end of the pool, let, let's 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 uh, dip out toe in the water. Let's just see how it is. Let's give it a shot. Let's give it like let's, let's a month, right? Try a month, see if it works, yeah. and then and maybe even if it, th then you could iterate. You know, and do some A/B testing. Okay, maybe this one didn't work. This could work, and then and then do it, and then see how it fits. Right? That seems so reasonable. Buy in from your employees, and I yeah. think that buy in from your employees really matters. You have to go at this as a company and decide we're gonna do this and yeah. we're going to have the discipline around it. And it takes all of us. I will give one piece of advice, um, which I feel adamantly about, uh, which is you can choose to take Fridays off. You can choose, we chose to take Mondays off, which works really well for us. Um, but what I would suggest is if at all possible, make sure that everybody's taking the same day off. Cause I do know there have been companies where they let the employees choose what day they want to take off. And that's nice for flexibility for employees, but the problem is it's not whether or not you're you know, officially open that day. 
it's the volume of emails and Slack communications yeah. and, you know, feeling like you need to be mentally tied into work that you're trying to avoid with the four day work week. And so the reason that having Mondays off works for me is because I can be pretty confident that unless there is an emergency, I'm not going to get a ton of emails from my boss or my team uh, or any, uh, and I can actually shut my brain off from work that day and get some mental space. Those are such great points. And in particular, I, I wonder how you feel about this. I'm partly concerned about with the hybrid because it does seem that all these companies are coalescing the, you know, with the hybrid model in two or three days a week, which is on the surface, fantastic. But I, I wonder if it's gonna have that faith that you just mentioned is that somebody, let's say, let's say where I live in the, in the Northeast in the New York area. So I commute in, takes an hour and a half, even though I'm like 30 minutes away from Manhattan, there's always traffic yeah. and something wrong. So let's say it takes an hour and a half to commute in, an hour and a half to come back, right? Yeah. I get in there. And then I hear this from people saying they get in there and now they're just in the building sending emails and doing Zoom calls because yeah. they look around and no one's there. Yeah. So it's like, why, why was this necessary? It just feels like, it just feels like, okay, we just, and, and, I, and the people who I speak to who really can tell me this, they kind of sort of irate because they feel like, why couldn't you figure this out to make sure, hey, I need to be with Megan. So why aren't we together when we're in? Otherwise, it feels like very heavy handed, like you're just forcing me to do it for the sake of doing it. So, so I think these things, yeah, the leadership really has to think it through and really speak to their employees and make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah, you got to make sure that the solution fits the problem that yeah. you were initially trying to address, right? And, uh, and sometimes they don't, like sometimes they drift yeah. from that and you need to sort yeah. of do a, you know, if we took that fourth, that fifth day off and you came in on Tuesday morning to a hundred emails in your inbox mm -hmm. and like, you know, a sea of work to do that would completely negate the, the time that you had off. Right. Um, it's like the, the post vacation when people, <laughs> people take a vacation and they come back and they're so overwhelmed right. that they never want to take a vacation. <laughs> right, again. Right. You know, you gotta be careful about that stuff. And it does, it, it's not just in the first time that you set up this kind of arrangement. It's a continuous Reevaluation, um, tightening of your discipline around it, reworking it, indoctrinating new people into uh, the approaches, and uh, it takes grooming uh, that that will be with us for our life as a company. And the good thing is, as you pointed out, that there's a group that's that's really helping out companies do that. So, so it's the Barnes who started from New Zealand and their perpetual. I forgot the exact name of financial perpetual, whatever it is in New Zealand. But then they, I think they handed the reins over to Joe O'Connell, right? I believe. Yes, that's who and, I was thinking of. Yeah. And, and so they give some really good, all the, you know, in addition to the advice that you offered. So for people yeah. who are thinking about it, you can kind of check into it. They seem like really nice people. They've been doing a lot. And right now, what? Scotland has done it. The Microsoft Japan, Spain Same. is working on it. Mm -hmm. um, Iceland, uh, Mark Takano, congressman from uh, California, has put in a bill to get a four-day work week. We'll see where that's going to go. So it's really, there's a, and there's a lot of companies. I think the last list that I saw from them, it was like 50 companies-ish here in the U.S. and I think the U.K. and Ireland. So not even other, you know, not even taking account other places that were just lining up to do it. So this is, this is getting some momentum. For sure. The, at first I was like, is it just me? Is it because I work at a four-day week company yeah. that like I'm noticing this more? But then <laughs> yeah. I realized, no, it really it is. is gaining momentum. That um, organization you talked about, if people want to check it out, it's just fourdayweek.com, that like the number four mm -hmm. and then dayweek.com. Um, that's Joe's organization has been really helpful in running pilots. Um, we weren't, th that started after us, so we weren't in that yeah. pilot, but I've gotten to join some coaching and uh, meet with them. And uh, it's been a really good group. And I, you know, the, the final point I'll say on, on the change and the momentum that we've seen, it's like, it seems, it seems strange until you realize that five day week was arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. it, it started, the five day work week, work week started, you know, with, with Henry Ford and mm -hmm. uh, deciding that like, hey, we shouldn't have people working seven days a week. We should give them, you know, on days and off days. And we should make sure that there's, uh, a commitment from employers to employees about how many days they, they'll be on. And that's where the five-day work week came from. And so it's not like it was carved in stone. Uh, it's 
it's something that can change and work so much has changed about work since that time we've gone remote we've got so much more technology yeah. the communication channels and methods have all changed the actual goals have changed i think it's fair to say that the schedule can change too as long as you're thoughtful about it and you know what it is that you're trying to get out of a given work week is that great and this is going to sound kind of crass to say but because of the pandemic these things emerged and it's amazing and it's really it benefits workers so much and think about it, to your point it's so silly where we all know let's say it's an august friday who's really after like one two o'clock who's really engaged in work i mean it, come on who are we kidding like why are you going to force somebody to stay at their desk in a cubicle under those fluorescent lights looking out the window if you even have a window that's beautiful outside, knowing if you don't get out right away, you're gonna be stuck in traffic to get home because everyone's going to the shore or wherever they're going. Yeah. It's silly. It's just so yeah. it's so antiquated. It doesn't make choose. any sense. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people choose Friday for that reason that they yeah. realize they start to lose people towards the end of the week. Yeah. And they want to and I notice, so I'm the inverse because I don't work on Mondays. You know who's working on Friday at 4 p.m.? I'm working on Friday <laughs> yeah. at 4 p.m. because yeah. it's like, that's my work block. And yeah. but I feel good about that because I had Monday off, but I do, like I start to get texts from my friends and like the, you know, offsite activities start to pop up around like noon on Friday. And I'm like, stop it. I'm yeah, like, yeah, stop yeah, it. yeah, no, I got to focus. Leave me alone, wait. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's that, that's exactly right. Like work is is really, it's about kind of harnessing the stamina that you have and you could stretch that out yes over five days and have like highs and lows in that stamina, or you can give people actual rest, a yes. true three-day weekend so that they can get restored. And then you can have concentrated, really high productive days on a shortened week. And I think that's the choice here, right? I think we got to end on that. That's perfect. Cause that's exactly what it is because we all go through this where you know, we have lives, things go on. So you come into the, you know, five days of just grueling commute back and forth, eight hours plus in the office, you're just shot and you're exhausted. And the quality of the work has to go down. Come on, it's only reasonable. So this way you can be more intentional. You can just decompress, you know, even with a two day weekend, think about it. One day is usually for chores and things around the house and what have you. So you pretty much have one day ish. I mean, there's no way for every, our mental health and our physical health and emotional health to kind of recoup in that short time frame. It's just impossible. It's just it's impossible. And this is gonna sound I, and I mean this, but this is gonna sound trippy. But I I contend a lot of why people in the, in our country, let's just talk about our country because I know of this, are angry, drink too much, take too much drugs, both illegal and pharma, you know, and prescribed, because we're just worn out and tired from that, from the I'm nine to five crazy. every day, right? Yeah. And it's interesting, like, you know, one thing that people have asked me since I, so I'm a parent, I have a five-year-old daughter mm -hmm. and um, people are like, oh, you must save a ton on childcare, right? Like, do you, do, do you like yeah. uh, save money on childcare? Cause you have that extra day back. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I ship my kid off to school on Monday because <laughs> yeah. what happens is my week is really busy. Yeah. And then my weekends are chaotic because she is I love her to pieces, but like she's high demanding. <laughs> yeah. To play. She has questions for me. She needs a snack. And so Saturdays and Sundays aren't calm for me. They're not yeah. a break. They're, <laughs> they're high intensity. And then Monday she goes to school, um, preschool. And I truly get that day that just for me and I can read and I can think yeah. and I can go. How walk. great is that? And I swear to God, I come in on Tuesday, a smarter person. I, I, was that right? It's so, it makes so much sense. And I would yeah. love 10 years from now, I bet you what'll happen, you'll have these like Harvard's and Yale studies to say, wow, this was great on mental health. This was great for the family. It was great on so many levels, you know, that yeah. made it better for people. And, and we'll think about it, even during the pandemic, it, everyone worked really hard and everything was, yeah. you know, the stock market was on fire. So it shows that yeah. these, that yeah, there are different ways of doing it. Remote work, you know, just without a doubt. It was very successful. So, so this is great. So I'm so glad, I'm so glad you took the time, Megan, to share with everybody, because it's one of these things that people are so interested about, you know, whether the four day yeah. week, work week, remote first options, and they're just really not sure. So this way you were giving a first hand approach. This is what it's like. This is what's going on. And I love that you just gave 
fair, you know, advice, you know, here's the good stuff, but here's what you also have to do. That's so people perfect. have a good aware of it. So this is, this is great. So for people who are watching, they may want to go to their bosses and say, Hey, could we try this? Let's check it out. And managers who are watching this might say, huh, you know what, this makes a lot of sense. Let's, let's kick it around. So this is why I love doing this stuff because it's, it gives actionable advice. You know what I mean? We could talk a lot of times you could talk about uh, like whatever, Oh, here's what Elon Musk did or what Jeff Bezos did, but all right, what does that mean for us? Yeah. But with these things, it's like, okay, we could take something and make something happen with it. So, so I, I'm so glad that you were able to you know, walk everybody through it and, and bring it up to their attention. And then hopefully, hey, hopefully then you get some emails from people saying, hey, guess what? <laughs> Megan, yeah. guess what? This is how we're doing it. And we need some help. What should yeah, we do? That's, so, yeah, that's no, that's awesome. awesome. And I appreciate you taking an interest in it. It really has been. You know, it's been a really fascinating experiment yeah. for us. Not now, no longer an experiment. Now it's sort of been proven for us, and it fits with our yes. whole vision of like the world is bigger than this little screen in front yeah. of your face. And if you can get a little bit of time back to break away from that, maybe get outside, get a little <laughs> bit of fresh air. Excellent. That's better Excellent. for everybody. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Megan. This was fantastic. Thanks a lot, John. Take, take care. All right. Bye bye.